Hi, it's Mr. Anderson and welcome to Biology Essentials video number 26. This is on behavior and how behavior affects natural selection. Um, this is a picture of Charles Darwin. I think he's about 50 years old in this picture. He seems to just be thinking and he did a lot of that. Uh, this is uh, at his house at Down, uh, his thinking path. And so what he would do is he would put some rocks here in a pile and then he would walk around and every time he walked by he would kick another rock out of the way as a way to kind of count the number of um, times he's walked around the thinking path. And so Darwin thought a lot. And in fact, when you read The Origin of the Species, it's a lot of mental arguments. But there's no genes and there's not any math really to back it up. And so um, Darwin was right, but he also didn't measure natural selection. In other words, there were, at the time he was walking around this path, that whole peppered moth with the white color and the dark color was going on in England. And if he would have actually been measuring, which nobody else was at that point, he could have gotten some data uh, to back up his theories. And today we measure natural selection everywhere. Um, not only in the beaks of the finches in the Galapagos, but in the guppies of South America and in the viruses of HIV. And we measure it everywhere. Um, and so what I'm going to try to do in this video is talk about four types of behavior and how they would affect natural selection. Remember behavior, it's how you act, can either be innate or it can be learned. Innate means you're born with it and so it's in your genes. Learned means you pick it up during your lifetime. And so a chimpanzee that learns from its mother how to use a tool would be a learned behavior. However, uh, that that grabbing reflex in a baby chimpanzee holding on to its mom is actually innate. And so what we're going to look at is behavior in organisms and how they affect natural selection. Um, the two plant ones we'll talk about are trope, phototropism and then photoperiodism. This is growth towards or away from light and then growth in response to the amount of light. Uh, we'll talk about courtship and animals. Uh, example will be the bowerbird. And then finally we'll talk about how organisms can cooperate. Uh, example will do insects and flowers and how they uh, coordinate their efforts in symbiosis uh, through pollination. And so let's start with phototropism. Now, first of all, we should define what it is. Phototropism is growing in response to light. And so if the light is over here, you can actually see it in this picture. If the light is coming over here, remember what happens in a plant is the, the oxen will move away from the light. That makes the, 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 sem, the cells, on, cells on this side of the plant grow faster than the cells on this side. And so it'll kind of bend in that direction. Um, phototropism is growth towards light. It could be growth straight up. It could be growth at an angle. All of this is phototropism. Now, how does this apply to natural selection? Well, when you look at a forest, you think, uh, like a rainforest like this, you think it's very pretty. But it's really like war. There's a war going on between all the plants in this forest, and it's a light war. They're trying to get as much light as they can. And for all the trees that you see, there are a number of trees that you don't see. And that means that they don't get light, and that means that they die and their genes die with them. In other words, how did phototropism come to be? Well, it could be that oxen was used for another purpose, just to get plants to grow. But once you had differential movement of oxygen, uh, oxen, excuse me, then you could gr get growth in response to light. And so if you can't grow towards light, you die and the genes would die with you. But it's being tweaked on a daily basis. Um, what about photoperiodism? Photoperiodism is responding to the amount of light during the day. And so we can sense climate, or excuse me, weather with that. And so this is a rose, and it's a rose that's flowering. It's trying to attract pollinators. But it has a choice to make, this plant. had to, a, uh, And when I say that, it's, I'm anthropomorphizing a little bit it has been decided at what time it actually will flower. And what decided that was natural selection. So you imagine, let's say we have a bunch of roses and some flower way early in May and some flower in June and some flower in July. Well, if you flower too early, winter comes late and the rose may die. So it won't, even though it's flowered early and grown early, it can't pass that off because maybe there's no, um, insects to actually pollinate it or maybe it physically dies. Now July, we don't think of July being a time to winter. Um, so how could they die here? Well, let's say you flower late. That means you drop the seeds late. That means winter comes and kills them early or you don't have time to actually drop the seeds. And so there's this bell-shaped curve of a perfect time to flower 
They're sensing the photoperiodism using phytochromes and figuring out this is the time to flower. And so that's been chosen over time, what time they flower. You flower too early, it doesn't work, flower too late. But as the climate starts to change, we're probably starting to see a shift of this bell-shaped curve towards May. Okay, let's talk about courtship. Courtship in humans you're probably familiar with, but courtship in all animals is super important. And that's due to sexual selection. So this is a bower bird. A bower bird gets its name because it builds a bower. A bower is like a house. And this is a male bower bird, and it literally has built this whole bower. This is in Australia. It's a greater bower bird. So it's lined up these leaves in here. It's lined up all of these rocks and, and uh, these sticks, and the leaves are positioned here. In other words, this bower bird has made this attractive to attract a female. So she'll actually fly around the female bowerbirds looking for the best bower and she's going to choose to only mate with a male that can make like a super nice bower. Um, it's similar to uh, a, a guy with a very fancy car, a very fancy house trying to impress a female. And why is that? Well, if you are a, ma a male bowerbird that can build this beautiful bower, that probably means that you have a brain that works correctly, and that probably means that your DNA is intact, and so it's a really good judge of uh, your fitness. And so females that chose males that can make a really good bower are more, more likely to have offspring and pass those genes on. If you had a really messy bower as a male, um, you, you, you uh, didn't pass your genes on. As a result, that's been eliminated as well. So natural selection at play, in this case, is probably mostly sexual selection. And then finally, I want to talk about cooperation in pollination. Cooperation shows what's called coevolution. In other words, once flowers uh, started flowering, um, insects started trying to uh, eat the flowers. And initially, probably, that was a parasitic relationship. In other words, insects were trying to feed on the flowers. Plants figured out, and what I mean by figured out, is maybe some of those insects actually, while feeding on plants, transferred the pollen from one organism to another. And eventually we had this coevolution where the evolution of the flower and the evolution of the insects are inexorably linked together. If we have decrease in bee populations now, what's going to happen to the flowers? Well, maybe they'll have to evolve back to a wind uh, or some other way of distributing their pollen. Um, and this cycles back to Darwin again. So Darwin understood natural selection, understood all of this, unfortunately didn't study it, didn't actually measure these things. But he was looking in Madagascar, uh, I don't think he went, he could have, I'm not sure if he went there or not, but was looking at Darwin's orchid. It's named after Darwin after uh, that. But the cool thing about it is it's got about a foot long distance from the outside of the flower down to the bottom where the nectar uh, is found. And so, Darwin saw this orchid and he predicted that in the future they'll find some kind of an insect or something that has a really long um, proboscis. And what they found was this moth. Um, this moth has a proboscis that normally is in a butterfly or any moth or stuff like that. It'll actually wad up like that when they're flying around. But it'll unwind and so it can get to the nectar inside it. And we call this Xanthopin morganii, morganii predicta. And the predicta means that it was Darwin's prediction that it would uh, they would have that length. And so this is a coevolution between these organisms, but essentially the behavior that you have determines if you survive or die, and that leads to natural selection and eventually adaptation of the organisms. And so I hope that's helpful.